Zostałem. 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 Okay. Hello, Peter. Hello, this is great to be here and to be interviewed by you. Thank you so much for taking the time to have a talk with me. You are a philosopher, a theologian, a writer, a speaker. People from all over the world are following your work and uh, most of them struggle with the traditional way of being church and the conventional reading of the Bible. And to them you are some sort of pathfinder showing a new way to believe. You live in Los Angeles, but now we are here in Belfast. My favorite city in the world. City of my birth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you are running um, a festival called Wake. Um, what's it all about? So, you, you know, you mentioned that some people who read my work are challenged by their, the religious readings that they had as a child. They maybe have doubts. They um, have questions about their faith. Um, and the truth is, that's basically most of us. I mean, whether you're conservative, liberal, whatever religion you're part of, I think to be human is to have questions, is to you know, wrestle with unknowing, to question yourself. Uh, and that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, most of us, uh, it, it's scary because you know, we can be challenging the beliefs of our you know, forefathers, the beliefs of our friends, uh, the beliefs of our family. But it's, it's definitely, I think, part of being human. And in Wake, the festival, Wake is actually an Irish uh, ritual where when someone dies, you watch over the body. Uh, I don't know why, maybe because the body might rise up and run away <laughs> or someone might steal the body. Um, but also it, it, it's come to mean the celebration and mourning that happens after a funeral where you drink together, you cry together, you laugh together, you remember the, the person who has died and you try to bring something of that person into your life and into the future. And so Wake is a place for people who are experiencing the death of maybe their political or religious or cultural ideas, but they want a place where they can reflect on that, they can mourn and they can laugh, they can leave behind something but bring something forward into the future. And so Wake is really a festival for people to, to unpick their religious past, to find what is good, to question what maybe is difficult, and to find a different way of relating to that past. And we do that through philosophy, theology, we have uh, magicians, we have comedians, we have musicians. Uh, we'll sit in the pub, because it's Ireland, so we always have to sit in the pub, and we'll talk about our lives together. And um, we try to see whether we can bring unknowing and doubt uh, and complexity into the life of faith. On my trip from Germany to Belfast, I stayed one night in Dublin and my host told me that Brexit reopens old wounds and may bring back this Northern Ireland conflict. Now, you were born in Belfast. How have you experienced the troubles? Yeah, I mean, a lot of my work grew up, of course, in my experience of a conflict between, you know, it, it's difficult to describe, but sometimes you could say between Catholics and Protestants, but often between people who want Northern Ireland to be part of the United Kingdom and people who want a united Ireland. And I grew up in a city with walls everywhere, peace walls that, that were literally, you'd have one person on one side of the wall, their garden would hit the wall, and the person on the other side, their garden, would be on the other side, and they were enemies. And this was a city divided. And I saw how religion and politics got tied up in um, conflict. And the walls were a symbol for me of kind of the walls that we all create between ourselves and the other. So you have, you know, Protestants or Catholics or Muslims and Christians or uh, Buddhists and humanists. And I guess I was interested in, 
how do we navigate those walls? Uh, for me, a lot of conflict arises because uh, I think that you are other. You grew up on the other side of a mountain, on the other side of a river, on the other side of a wall, and you are the other who is a threat. But that actually, there is an otherness that is within us all. We, you know, we like to think that we have all the answers, that we know what we believe, but actually. You know, we have doubts and we have unknowing, we have sufferings, we have darkness. And just like a child says, there's a monster under the bed, right? There's no monster under the bed, the monster is inside them. But they take their own anxiety and trauma and they put it on a monster that's under the bed. So that we also sometimes take our doubt, our unknowing, our trauma, and we put it on someone else. They're the problem on the other side of the wall. And I guess growing up in Northern Ireland, I was interested in how do we come to terms with our own traumas and our own suffering? And how do we engage in real communication with people who are different from us? And part of that for me was realizing that we are different from ourselves. Uh, it sounds strange at first. You go, how can I be strange to myself? But, you know, if someone has an outburst of anger or if someone cries, over something, uh, or someone has, uh, they say something by mistake, you know, a name of their mother comes out when they meant their sister. Sometimes we're confronted by, oh my goodness, I have anxieties and fears and things that are going on in me that I don't even realize. And a lot of my work is about encountering the strangeness of our own beliefs and our own selves, and weirdly saying that that helps us uh, build bridges with other people who might at first seem like a threat. So would you say uh, your theology, we will speak about it later, um, is um, some kind of contextual theology arising out of Belfast and the troubles and your experience? Yeah, and for me, it's a universal experience. So, you know, if, if I'm a doctor and you're a student and I'm trying to teach you what cancer looks like, I'll show you an extreme version of cancer, right, first, uh, because you're not trained. And so you see the extreme version. And then over time, you learn to identify less extreme versions. For me, Belfast, when I grew up, was an extreme version of violence and how we separate from the other and how we build walls between each other. But it was a great training ground to explore how we do that all over the world. Even in contexts that aren't, there aren't physical walls, we build various walls. So for me, Northern Ireland was, yes, a contextual experience, but the reason why I'm in America now is because I think that helped me explore how Belfast was a microcosm of many of the, the, many of the things that make us human many of the problems that all of us face. This was just an extreme version of it. Now the conflict you experienced in Belfast, was it a conflict also in your own family? Have you been Protestant or Catholic and was this a theme, this religious aspect or not? Yeah, thankfully it wasn't a strong part of my upbringing. My family didn't have strong prejudices against, uh, I grew up in a Protestant background, but they had no strong prejudices against Catholics or anything like that. They were just trying to get by. And so, you know, thankfully, I didn't grow up in an environment where that was, that was a strong thing. I saw it in my school. And to be honest, it, I realized it was nothing to do with religion. It was nothing to do with, with uh, what people believed. Catholics, Protestants. It wasn't even to do with United Ireland. A lot of it was to do with the fact that we needed an enemy. The communities often form around having some enemy that we all hate. So what, what happens is we all say, if you're a Protestant community, it's the Catholics' fault. If only they weren't there, everything would be great. But actually we need the enemy, we need the Catholic. 
because there's actually problems within our own society. But as long as we have an enemy, we can ignore all of that. We can say they're the problem. But I realized that actually that's scapegoating. Scapegoating is where you create an enemy that helps you cover over the antagonisms and the problems that are within your community. And so you need it. Just like a hypochondriac needs their disease, so a community needs their enemy. Because while you have an enemy, you can, you can have social cohesion. And so my work was largely about how do we create social community without needing a scapegoat, without needing an enemy. What awakened your interest in religion or in the Christian faith? Yeah, I mean, I never grew up in a specifically religious environment. And I came to it when I was a teenager. And at first, in a very standard way, I had a type of conversion experience and I got involved in religion. But very quickly, I, I felt that theology wasn't about a belief in God or a belief in the world, you know, certain views on the world, why we're here, what we're doing, where we're going. I found a stream of theology that was designed to keep a question open, to help us navigate Uh, what it means to, f to find purpose in life, what it means to find depth and density in life, what it means to uh, encounter the otherness within ourselves. And I, I, I felt that theology had something important to say. So yeah, my, my interest in theology has just deepened and widened since that time as a teenager when I got involved in the church. Yeah. At first it was about God, now it's about something much, much wider. Um, you've got a PhD in philosophy. And why have you chosen to study this subject and not theology? That's a good question. I mean, I, I guess I started studying philosophy like many people because I thought I already had the truth. I already knew everything. Right? I just needed the evidence to back it up. So I went to, to university to find all of the evidence to tell me why I was right. And I went to philosophy because I thought, right. Um, but thankfully, the discipline began to crack away at that arrogance. Uh, there's a philosopher, um, it was actually a German philosopher, Heidegger, who said, students, you think students know nothing and lecturers know everything? No, 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 not at all. Students know everything, and it's the lecturers who don't know anything. And it's the role of the lecturer to bring the student into a learned unknowing, to help the student realize that the world is much more beautiful and complex and interesting than you first imagined. And that's what philosophy did for me. So I'm kind of grateful for it. So I went into philosophy to, to back up my worldview And I discovered a discipline that helped challenge my worldview. And my particular interest was the philosophy of religion. Yeah. Um, you founded a community called ICON. So what, is the, what, what was the reason for founding this community and what is the iconic character? Or how would you, what do you understand uh, by using the name ICON? Yeah. Uh, so ICON, so it was a community that I started in Belfast many years ago. And it was founded on an idea that instead of trying to cover over doubts, unknowing, complexity, trauma, instead of trying to fix those things, uh, maybe we need to give them space to breathe. Maybe there is a place for those things in our lives. And so ICON was a space where we explored Uh, the doubt and the complexity and the unknowing of life together. And the notion was that in doing so, uh, health might result. Religion traditionally has often been a promise of wholeness, completeness, having the answer. And secular, secular religions abound. You know, whenever someone says, you, you marry the right person, you'll be whole and complete. That's a secular promise of wholeness or if you do crossfit you do yoga or you have enough money uh, or you're you, you look the right way or you get famous 
then you'll be whole and complete. Now, nobody says it. Nobody says if you get famous, you'll be whole and complete. But, but sometimes we think that, that if we were famous enough, we would be. It's, it's implicit in every magazine, in every movie. You know, there's a promise that if you get revenge, if you, uh, if you have the right type of love, whatever it is. So in religion, in its sacred and secular forms, the tyranny of happiness and wholeness abounds. And I call it the tyranny of happiness because the more you try to be happy and pursue happiness, the more unhappy you get. The more you try to be certain, the more anxiety of uncertainty can result. So I explored a theological approach that said, what if we were free not to pursue our happiness, but we were freed from the pursuit of happiness? Not where we were free to have all of the knowledge of why we're here and what it's all about, but we were free to experience unknowing. And, and that's, that was what the theological project was. The, the see, seeing that actually there is more joy and depth in life when we can experience the brokenness of life, when we can tarry with it, when we can make peace with it, rather than try to run from it. And parotheology was born from that uh, intuition. Can you give some examples uh, for the activities or events you did while Icon was running? Every Icon was a bit different. Uh, we called it transformance art because it was a little bit like performance art but with the uh, emphasis on experiencing a type of transformation. And so, you know, I can take an example, but everyone was different. Uh, one night we did a, a service called Sins of the Father. You walked into the bar and as you were getting a drink, there were some DJs playing music. And over the music, there were the words, when I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? And once everybody had sat down, you would notice that there were hundreds of wine glasses around the, the room, all broken, cracked, smashed, and pieces of paper everywhere. And the service began with somebody saying, on the last day, all humanity stand before the judgment seat. The book of life is opened, and humanity look to see if God's name is written. And they say, when I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? And that night, we asked people to write down when they felt God had sinned against them, to write it on the paper. And if they didn't fold it, we read what people wrote. And this was serious stuff. I was honest and I was robbed. I prayed for my child and she died. I lost the one person that I loved and I tried so hard to be there for them. And as we read these out, we poured red wine into the broken wine glasses. So the wine would drip off the table and onto the bar uh, floor. And that night we set fire to these accusations so that the aroma would go up to heaven. And we said, God, these are our angers. And the whole service didn't answer that. It didn't say, oh, that's not really God, or you shouldn't be angry, or it'll all be okay in the end. We created a liturgical structure, like with readings from the Psalms and the book of Job, that said, you know what? This is faith. Being angry, being frustrated, speaking the truth, of the things that we hide from ourselves in everyday life, bringing them to the surface in community. And the whole structure of the service was designed to say, this is faith, being honest about the struggles that you're going through, bringing them through, through into the light of day, seeing that other people struggle just like you, there, in the midst of that, there is something theological going on. So that's just one example. You once said that Icon created a suspended space. What do you mean by this? Yeah, so in everyday life, 
we have lots of identities that describe who we are, theist or atheist or male or female or all of these, and they're important. Identities are important, gay, straight, you know, we have lots of ways that we pin down who we are. And that's part of the everyday world that we live in. Uh, but we wanted to create a space in our lives where we suspended our identities briefly, just for a moment, to encounter other people beyond whether they're conservative or liberal or gay or straight or anything like that. Now, the purpose wasn't to say those identities aren't important, but to say that our identities aren't everything. Our identities define us, but there are spaces in our lives, like the Irish pub is a good example. Now, there's actually, there's a comic book called uh, Knight and Squire. It's a British version of Batman and Robin. And it's quite funny, but in, in, in the, uh, the universe of Knight and Squire, there is a pub in London where all the superheroes and the supervillains go to drink on a Thursday night. And there's a spell over the pub that means that nobody can fight. And when you leave the pub, you disappear and you reappear somewhere random in London so nobody can follow anybody. So basically what you have is the supervillains and the superheroes have this one space in their lives where they can play darts together, they can have a drink together and they can talk about their life. And um, in a way, that's what a suspended space is. It's a desert in the oasis of life, a quiet, dry space where I am challenged to rethink my identity, to be challenged by the other, to hear the perspective of the other, and to realize that they are, they are human, they have an infinite subjectivity. Uh, the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas said that the face of another person is always saying, do not murder me, do not objectify me, do not destroy me. And so when you look at the other person, this call is always there, but we block ourselves off from it. So Icon was trying to create a space where we could hear that cry. And, and it was controversial because some of these identities are important to us. But a suspended space is one hour in our week where I symbolically lay my identity at the door. I enter into this space and I encounter you in your humanity so that when I leave the bar and I take my identities back on, I might be more sensitive to seeing you as human. And even though I disagree with you, I just had a drink with you in that bar with the magic spell. <laughs> and, and in that brief moment where we played darts together, I encountered something of your infinite depth and so now we argue not as enemies, but as colleagues and friends. So that's suspended space. I ask you, uh, what's the iconic character? And you once said, icon is, yeah, is an opposite definition to idol. Yeah. So how, how would you characterize an icon? And, and what has it to do with your fellowship, your community, which you founded in Belfast? Yeah. I was playing with the, as you say, the distinction between idol and icon. Mm -hmm. I was actually reading a book by a philosopher called Jean-Luc Marion, um, and he uses this distinction. And if you think of an idol, an idol is an object that uh, gives everything, right? You look at an idol, an idol is the essence of God in the object, right? Um, ideology comes from the same word. An ideology is I have the essence of the world. My ideology explains the world. So an idol is you've got God. An ideology, you understand the world. An icon is slightly different. An icon is something visible that draws you into the invisible. So if you look at an icon, if you love somebody, for example, you see their visible face and you like their face. I mean, you're in love with them. You're, you look at their face and it brings you joy. You see their smile. You see the twinkle in their eye. You know, that, you see their face. But the face also draws you into what you cannot see, their emotional life. 
their fears, their desires, their hungers. And so that's what an icon kind of is. When you love somebody, the face becomes uh, uh, that which draws you into something you cannot see. So again, Emmanuel Levinas says, when you love someone, you do not see the color of their eyes. So you, you know, you, you're looking at somebody, you're looking someone in the eyes. Uh, if you're objectifying them, you can go, this is the color of their eyes. But when you get into a great conversation and we lose ourselves in talking about the old days, I don't see the color of your eyes anymore. I, I mean, I'm looking at them, but I don't even see them because your eyes kind of begin to be a window into your subjectivity. So when I called icon, icon, I wanted to create a space where we used words to describe you know, reality. We used words and we used poetry, we used art, we used comedy. But these became windows into something that cannot be described with words, with music, with comedy. That we developed a theopoetics a type of language that draws us beyond language, um, that draw us, draws us into an experience of depth that cannot be contained by some dogma or confessional faith. And yet an icon takes seriously words. That's the funny thing. It's like a poet talking about love. A poet loves words so much, but they create a poem that kind of like expands words. It, it, it draws you beyond them. And so in a sense we go, you have to take seriously your religious or political perspective. But if you think it captures everything, it's an idol. If it opens you up to something deeper, it's an icon. Now I want to switch a little bit to your theology. Um, your first book uh, named How to Speak of God or respectively How Not to Speak of God. Uh, was published 2006 and um, yes it made you to a, a prominent figure in the emerging church movement um, but um, since then you published five more books and it seems to me that uh, your approach changed a little bit so in, in this book this is your first book you have a more apophatic approach and then it gets more existential or plain said um, in, in how not to speak of God or how to speak of God, um, you, you write that, yes, we have to speak of God, but we can't define him. Um, and in your later books, um, you are presenting a more atheistic approach um, by showing that Christianity critiques religion all the whole. Are you sharing this perception from me? And how would you describe your... Um, Yes, movement or your um, thinking, how it changed. That, did it change? Yeah, in some ways, uh, there's always a temptation for, to, to kind of like say, oh, I haven't changed, I've, I've deepened my thinking. Or, uh, like, but actually, thinkers change. So whenever we think of any great philosopher, uh, we can sometimes think that they have one position, but actually... You can sometimes find phases and developments. So I want to say, no, I haven't changed, but maybe I have. <laughs> um, in, in some ways, I think I've tried to deepen, always just trying to deepen the work that I'm doing. So I started with the mystics. The mystics are wonderful because they say that the, the, the standard mystical definition of God from Anselm is God is greater than we can conceive. So in his proslogion, he says, God is not the greatest conceivable being, right? God is greater than we can conceive. And that's very key because Anselm is saying, you can conceive of something great, but you can also conceive of something greater. And now you can't conceive of what it is, but you can conceptualize, you can think that there is something greater than you can think. <laughs> and he says, God... Is, that's the name of God. When we say the word God, we are saying that which is greater than we can ever imagine or ever think or ever conceive. And so the mystics are always saying theology, as soon as we speak of God, nominate, name God, we have to denome, denominate God. 
And I like that in English, I don't know what the German is, we talk about denominations, which are church groups. And I like that phrase because to denominate means to dename. And I think that part of the role of a church is to denominate God, to, to remind us that we cannot name God, that every time we say God is love, we have to also say, but not as I understand it. Oh my goodness, you know, my understanding is so limited. So the mystics start us on this road of humility, of seeing that doubt and unknowing complexity is part of faith. They're always reminding us that the holy is wholly other. That as soon as we think we understand things, we're on a bad path. Like that's what the Buddhists mean potentially when they say, if you ever meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Because it's not the Buddha, you know? It's like, as soon as you think you've got God, if you meet God in your theology, kill him, because it's not God, right? Um, that there's always something elusive about the divine. And uh, so the mystics have beautiful, playful ways of reminding us of this. But I think in my later work, I, I, I push it and push it and push it to the point where we're like, oh yeah, well, what if actually then theology is not about naming God, uh, and, or even about unnaming God, but is about a certain way of existing in the world, a certain way of experiencing a depth in the world, a certain way of relating to people. So Emmanuel Levinas, a great Jewish thinker, I mean, he, he uses the words atheism and theism, but you kind of get the impression that when he says the word atheist, he's not talking about belief in God or not. He says uh, atheism is closing yourself off from the infinite cry of the other that says, do not murder me. And then theism is opening yourself up to that cry and responding to it. That's a very different way of defining things. And at first you'd go, that's completely unorthodox. You'll never find that in the Bible. <laughs> and then you read, those who love know God, and those who do not love do not know God. You're like, well, what does that mean? If you love, as in if you open yourself up to the other and respond to them, you know God. That's, that's bizarre and crazy, but actually perhaps it's the most orthodox thing you could, you could believe. So somebody says, I don't believe in God out there, but, but they genuinely respond in love to the other. You're like, well, does that mean that they're more in line with the, the prophets. They're more in line with the God of the Bible than someone who believes in God, but seems to be cut off. And by the way, that's not a negative thing, like they're evil or bad. It's just sad. When I cut myself off from the world, I'm destroying myself. I am living a one-dimensional life where all I care about is Netflix and, 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 and my own well-being. It's depressing. So, and you see this in the Bible. You notice Jesus once said, uh, he was asked, what's the most important commandment? And he said something fascinating. He said, to love God. Now, everybody would have agreed with him. There was a time where everyone agreed with that. But then he added a second bit. He said, oh, and love your neighbor like you love yourself. So he was saying that to love God and to love your neighbor, they're, they're interconnected. But then you go further in the Bible and you come across this idea that to love your neighbor is to love God. So at first you go love God and love your neighbor and they're interconnected. And then further on in the Bible, you don't get love God, you get love your neighbor and that is you loving God. And that's a very big innovation. That's like, that's like the first step is to go, well, of course you want to love God if you're a Christian. And you know what it looks like? It looks like loving your neighbor. And then you get to the point where, where you go, you know what, you can drop the first bit. What's important is that you love your neighbor and in losing yourself in loving your neighbor, you're actually loving God. That for me is the trajectory of the biblical tradition and the role of the church is to help sensitize us to the call of the other. And we need that. Why do we need that? 
for a simple reason. In everyday life, we use people as, as tools to buy products, to give us services. I don't care about your infinite subjectivity. I don't care. You're just a guy interviewing me. I don't care. And it's so easy, Simone Weil says this, that, that we can so easily get caught up in a world where we just treat everybody as objects. And of course that's natural. And we repay hatred with hatred and violence with violence, bitterness with bitterness. She calls it gravity. Gravity doesn't just define things falling from the sky. Gravity is the, the laws of psychology, where if you treat me badly, I will take that hatred and I will throw it at somebody else, or at you, or at myself. But then she says we need spaces of grace. And grace isn't another world outside of gravity. Grace is the moments where the world of gravity is short-circuited where I repay hatred with love, bitterness with kindness, anger with tenderness. And for me, we need spaces in our lives where we are encouraged to find grace. And that might be in the poker room or the pub. It might be the coffee shop or the confessional. But we need spaces in our lives where we are sensitized to the other and at its best, that is what church should be. Okay. Yeah, we are stepping deeper in your thinking. And at one point in your development, you started to give your thinking a name and you called it pyrotheology. Yeah. Could you explain why pyrotheology and the main thoughts in a nutshell? What is it all about, pyrotheology? You know, it, it was a strategic thing. Uh, when we did ICON, we did a service called Pyrotheology. And it was uh, because I came with a quote. I'd heard this quote from Bonaventura Doretti. It said, the only church that illuminates is a burning church. And so he was a Spanish anarchist and he, you know, he meant it and said to burn the churches. But I like this because I went, well, there's a double meaning because maybe, you know, the church should be on fire like the burning bush that's, that's on fire but not consumed. Maybe there is something about destruction, like a forest fire, that is productive. So we call the service pyrotheology. And then later I thought, you know what, that might be a good name to talk about what I'm doing. Now here's the trick. The trick is when you give something a name, you can, you can get it to catch on a bit, right? I'll tell you when I think pyrotheology started to exist. I think the moment of its birth was whenever a journal came out critiquing pyrotheology, right? So what happened is like five or six academics got together and they critiqued what pyrotheology was. And I was like, there it is. That's when it was born. Because what it was was just a disparate sense of everything I was talking about, right? But as soon as they defined it to attack it, and they attacked it in a very kind way, you know, they were critiquing in, the, in, the, in a good way, but as soon as they started to define it as this is what pyrotheology is and this is why, you know, we, we want to critique it, they made it into something and pyrotheology was born. So retroactively, I give a name to nothing, people then critique it and it becomes something. So pyrotheology has now become the name for a type of theological approach that takes very seriously the unknowing, um, the, the doubt of life, that actually sees rupture and antagonism and facing trauma as central to the theological position. It's becoming something. And really, uh, we'll only ever be able to really define what it is when it's dead, <laughs> when it's finally passed. But at the moment, it's a living, body of thought uh, that is exploring the importance theologically of creating a space where we encounter the otherness that we are, that we experience um, the, the darkness and find life within it. So there's a verse in the Bible that says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And in a sense, if you think about it, like the thing that we all agree on is that we do not want to know the truth. 
the truth of our desires, the truth of our bitterness, the truth of our anger, the truth of our frustrations. We pretend to ourselves that everything is great. When I look out into the world, I'm amazed that people get on with life. Like we hide from ourselves and from other people all of the stuff that's going on. And parotheology plays with the idea that if we are honest and we come to know the truth of all of those things that are going on, bring them to the light of day, there is something freeing and something beautiful about that and we will find freedom. The traditional Christian um, interpretation of the Bible, there we have a problem, we have sin, mm -hmm. and we have crucifixion as um, the solution. Yeah. And how do you interpret original sin and the crucifixion? Yeah, they're very central to, to my work. Um, I, I always find interesting in the theology that we use these terms like original sin and crucifixion, and, But then it's really hard to pin down what we mean by them. And they become like almost like Harry Potter world. They take on this weird magical form. When I find these terms like original sin to be very technical and to define something very specific, sin kind of means lack and original means first. You know, original comes first. Existentialism talks about a type of alienation that is part of being human. To be human is to experience a lack. And that we try to fill this lack in all sorts of ways, through money and fame and religion and having the right car, we try to fill this lack. And it drives us. You know, you could say capitalism is a form of this. You're always trying to find a way to fill this lack. And it destroys us. We imagine other people have it. We hate them for it. We, we, we always seem to be uh, be unable to get this thing that will make us complete. Uh, when I talk about the other has it, it's like whenever you break up with somebody and you're sitting in your house with a tinfoil hat on collecting urine and bottles and you're imagining that the other person is having a great time partying, right? You're fantasizing that the other has all this happiness that you don't have. Original sin for me is just a name for that. It's a theological name for this original lack that we feel in our bodies. And the crucifixion uh, is about forgiveness of sin. What does that mean? Now, uh, let's make a distinction. If sin means lack, uh, there's two types of lack, two types of nothing, right? Imagine you have no money, right? You don't have any money, that's nothing. Imagine you have debt. A debt is a lack that is something, it's a nothingness that is something. If you have a debt, it ties you to institutions you hate, makes you work in a way that you despise. People are looking for the money back, it makes you anxious, horrible, right? Debt is a nothingness that is something. Now, if I pay a debt, I fill the lack, you owe me a hundred pounds, somebody pays the debt, they give you a hundred pounds, right? I think our society is based on a fantasy that we can pay the debts, like often literally, right? We're kept in debt, always trying to pay off our debts. But also the existential debt, the original sin, this lack that we feel that there's something that we need to fill it. We're always running around trying to find it. Theology has this idea not of the payment of debt, but the forgiveness of debt. If I forgive a debt, I don't pay it. I say that the nothingness that is something is nothing. That nothingness that is holding you in horrible ways is nothing. So weirdly, forgiveness of debt is the rendering nothing of a nothing that is something. <laughs> um, and in, in theology, it's the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was a time when debts weren't paid, they were forgiven. All debts are forgiven. So when I talk about the forgiveness of sin, I think that is just a very simple notion that to experience the forgiveness of sin is to experience the freedom from a, a lack in your life. Not a, not a fulfillment of it, but rather a sense that I feel a lack and that's okay. I am free from the sting of the death, the sting of the debt so that I can live my life. So I think, I think that I'm making a claim to Christianity.
That's the funny thing. I'm saying that these are way that this theology I'm talking about is embedded in Christianity, um, and that these very mystical, you know, superstitious notions, or like about sin is like chewing gum and going out with girls who you know chew gum or whatever. Right? I mean, that's all rubbish. Sin is a lack. Forgiveness of sin is freedom from that lack. I live in LA, the most religious place in the world, because everyone is being promised that they can be freed from the lack if they do CrossFit, if they eat kale, if they're famous enough, if they look the right way, if they have enough money. That is original sin. We're trying to fill the lack with money or with fitness or whatever. Forgiveness of sin is the experience of the freedom from that frenetic, pursuit of wholeness. You're not free to be happy, you're free from the pursuit of happiness. So, your work draws heavy on psychoanalysis. Um, Jacques Lacan, yeah. um, for instance. Um, why do you call it pyrotheology and not pyropsychology? Uh, Would it yes. be the better name? or? <laughs> um, I think that psychoanalysis is an event in the history of thought, which means that I think that psychoanalysis, there's been a number of events, things that happen in the history of thought that as soon as they happen, everything's changed. You know, people like Darwin and uh, Kant and uh, uh, Copernicus, these are events, like once they've done their thinking, nothing's the same. Even people who disagree with them, it's not the same, like they have to take them seriously. For me, psychoanalysis uh, is an event in thought, and Lacan is the person who helps us see that. And I think that the mix of psychoanalysis, philosophy, and theology, that, that intersection where those three things meet is an important place. And parotheology is the, is the intersection where they meet. Um, so, uh, yeah, I am very interested in psych I also think psychoanalytic ideas are embedded in religion. Freud was very much doing stuff within the Jewish tradition. And Lacan was doing close readings of the Apostle Paul. So the, it's, like, it's like when people say, oh, you're, you're very existential. Yes, where did, where did existentialism come from? I mean, if there's ever a philosophy that borrowed from the Jewish and Christian tradition is existentialism. <laughs> you have Kierkegaard, you have Pascal, you have Nietzsche. I mean, these are religious figures par excellence. So yeah, um, I, I think that there's a real connection between existentialism, psychoanalysis, and theology. And theology has been robbed of its treasure. Those psychoanalysts, those pesky psychoanalysts and existentialists have stolen the treasure of theology and I want to steal it back. <laughs> <laughs> so when you want to steal it back, um, then you have an imagination of God in your system, in your thought system. So uh, if it's a theology, so how would you describe it? What, um, what significance has God in your thinking? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a, uh, a, a thinker, uh, Kester Bruin, um, who once I remember in an interview, he was asked, do you believe in God? And he said, yes. He says, I, I believe that there are millions of gods in the world. And I'm a theologian because I believe that our job is to kill them, right? So, so and that's, I think that's very insightful. It's like the world is full of gods. I mean, if gods are what we worship, then you know, there's so many things that we worship. If God is this big other that we give our lives to, um, even to our own detriment, there, there, is, there are gods all over. And theology takes seriously our gods. But Christianity is in kind of a sense about killing our gods, about freeing us from certain gods. And that's a theological job. So I take seriously the idea that... Um, human beings worship and we are caught up in things that are bigger than ourselves and a lot of that is negative and that we need to find a way to parse that to think it through to free ourselves from things and that's the role of theology would you say that you are standing in a tradition of the god is dead theology from the 60s yeah i i've seen i see 
that's been very influential to me. Radical theology, the death of God theology. I think there was a real moment. I think the 20th century was a really poor time for theology, right? I think it was mostly rubbish, right? A desert, <laughs> except in certain moments. And the 1960s, I think, was this really productive time for theology. Uh, in, in the conservative world, as well as the liberal world, as well as the radical world, it was a point where just theology was kind of cool, right? I mean, Time magazine had Paul Tillich on the front, had Thomas Altizer in front. People were talking about theology in the coffee shops, uh, on the bus. It was like there was a moment where theology was like r alive. And then it kind of died in the 70s and the 80s and the religious right and theology became this, this basement discipline that had as much credibility as astrology. Um, so I want, I, but I, I want to be part of a movement to see that theology has something interesting to say and it is in continuity with radical theology, the death of God theology. Um, and by the way, when you say the word death of God, I love it because it sounds so anti-Christian. The death of God? How can you have a theology based on the death of God? <laughs> and then you go, oh yeah, that's the very essence of Christianity. That God dies on the cross and then resurrection and you know how is God resurrected but but the death of God is actually it's part of, of uh, theology is thinking about what does it mean for God to die and for Nietzsche Nietzsche was interesting he used this term when he talked about the death of God he wasn't talking to Christians he was talking to secularists he says God has died and people don't realize and what he meant by that is people don't realize that, that you might say God is dead, and which might mean that meaning has dissolved for you, but you haven't felt it in your bones. You haven't experienced the horror of it. He says the lightning has been seen, but the thunder hasn't, hasn't been felt in your belly. So people are walking around going, God is dead, but oh my goodness, you, you want to take seriously what it means to experience the loss of everything. And I think Christianity tries to help you experience that. You have to experience the crucifixion, the loss of meaning. And in that crucifixion, only as you experience it in the depths of your being, can you experience resurrection. And Nietzsche was like, oh, our society hasn't even got to the point where they have experienced what it means to experience nihilism, to, to actually experience what, what comes after. Your interpretation of Paul and the crucifixion seems to be influenced by, Porsche, um, by Slavoj Žižek, this um, political philosopher. Um, he said about himself that he is an athe atheist Christian. Would you say you're a Christian atheist? Yeah, I like, I, I like to problematize the distinction between theism and atheism in numerous ways. So the very simplest way is to go, there is a little bit of a theist and an atheist and an agnostic in all of us. And the less we acknowledge that, the more violent we become to the bit that we won't acknowledge. So people who hate atheists, Sometimes, not always, but sometimes there's a little bit of an atheist in them that they have repressed and it comes out in anger at another and people eat theists, it's the same. Like there are atheists who pray when something goes wrong. There are theists who think that it's all absurd. <laughs> um, that we are like a room full of people and someone's asked us, are you a theist or an atheist? And we have a big debate and there's a few people in the room who say, no, we're, we're an atheist. But the majority say they're a theist. So somebody goes out of the room and says, we're, we're a theist. But there are little elements that aren't. So our brain is like that community of people. And so part of me is going like, well, theism and atheism need to be blurred a little bit. But also in theology, atheism and theism have always been friends and lovers. This is the secret they won't tell you, right? We always think atheism and theism are enemies. They're not. Oh my goodness, they dance together. There's like, uh, in philosophy, atheism and theism are bouncing against each other in the most passionate love affair. And when they're separated, it's devastating to both. 
Atheism becomes like an adolescent cry against superstition. And theism becomes like a, a, you know, as I say, a basement discipline with as much credibility as astrology. But when they come together, they enrich each other, they deepen each other, it's, it's beautiful. So for me, atheism has always been part of theology. The original mystics were atheists because they said every time you have a theism, a belief in God, you have to be an atheist and saying that's not God. Every time I say God is this, I have to say, no, he's not. You know, so there is a, there's an atheism in theism. And, uh, you know, it gets more interesting than that. But even the mystics had atheism embedded in their, in their theology. And so in that sense, I like to use the term a stroke theism. I'm an atheist, but with a, with a stroke between the A and the T, uh, showing that there is an ambivalence and a movement uh, in the theology. I already mentioned it, that 2006, your first book was published. And it seems to me that um, your uh, theology developed very far. And the last book um, was from 2015 with the, um, the Divine Magician. And it seems to me that your theology has reached some kind of maturity and your, the thought system is conclusive. So I wonder what comes next. Um, do you have a project, uh, a, a, a next book or what, what can you put on your, on your work on top? So it, it seems to be some sort of finished. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I was writing books regularly until The Divine Magician. And when I finished that book, I was like, I felt that my work had reached a point of maturity, oh, as really? you say. Yeah, now, they're popular books, as, and I'm not writing in an academic way. I try to write in a way that is for intelligent people who don't need to learn a specialist language. So that's my, that's my desire. So I could always write it in a more technical way. Um, but the Divine Magician did signal a, and I, I would say a stopping point. Not forever, but just like a resting point in a journey. And that's why I haven't written much since. So I've taken two years out of writing to, to try to work out, okay, what's the next step? And I think I definitely, of course, because I'm you know, reading more, I'm listening to other people, uh, I feel like I'm deepening my work. But the Divine Magician did signal uh, an important point where I, was, I felt finally able to articulate um, something central about my theological approach. But I do have a book on the absurd that I'm writing. I also have a movie that I, uh, I wrote and then I reworked and co-wrote. And we've just finished filming a short version of that called Making Love. And I also have a book of fairy tales. So, uh, I find now I'm finding other ways to express these ideas in film, in fairy tales, and uh, in another book of philosophy. There's something coming up. Yes, I've got a few things <laughs> coming up. Yeah, yeah. The fairy tale book is Enduring Love, which is about how difficult love is to endure. And then there's Making Love, which is the, the movie. And then there is um, this book on the absurd. I want to come back to practical questions. So uh, we started with ICON, uh, your own community. Um, how would you, um, yes, critique or think of the, as of today, the Emerging Church movement? And we have in Great Britain this fresh expressions of church, which is in the institution in the Church of England. Yeah. And we have in Germany also a fresh expressions movement. They want to learn from Great Britain. So from your perspective, what, what do you say about these movements? Yeah, I am, you know, Icon and my work is kind of like, a, it has a friendly antagonism <laughs> with the emerging church. It is, it is because of the emerging church that I have any platform at all. And uh, Icon was seen as part of the emerging church. The, there's a slight difference, but because for me, the emerging church and fresh expressions has mostly been immersed into progressive and liberal theology. And icon and paro theology is in the radical tradition. For me, liberal and progressive theology 
still operates with this notion of an underlying wholeness and harmony um, and a, a reconnection with the ground of being, with oceanic oneness, mystical experience. And paro-theology is very much exploring the idea that there is a f that, that doubt, ambiguity, complexity, and all those things, um, there's not a way to cover over them. There, what, what we, faith is found in an experience of an, an embrace of them. So there is this difference between liberal theology and radical theology. Uh, I, I hate to say it, by the way, because as soon as I explain the difference, everybody's going like, well, I want to be a progressive, because that sounds so much nicer. Progressive theology, well, there's an underlying harmony, original blessing, wholeness to the world. I want that. Of course you do. <laughs> Radical theology sounds horrible, right? The good news of uh, liberal theology is there is a harmony and a wholeness and a oneness, and you can know the truth in this life or the next. The good news of parotheology Life is shit and you don't have the answer, right? If you hear those, you go like, that doesn't sound like good news, that sounds like bad news. But what I want to argue is actually the good news of more liberal theology is bad news. <laughs> and the bad news of radical theology is good news. The more, you can exp the more you can embrace the idea that you don't have the answer and that life is difficult, the better life becomes. And weirdly, the more you pursue wholeness and completeness, the more anxious you become. So it's counterintuitive. It's, it's a weird, like, you have to lose your life to find it. It doesn't make sense. You have to lose certainty in order to find a certain certainty that, 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 that's beyond the intellectual. Um, so emerging church, I think, is, is great. But I want to, I want, here's my warning to fresh expressions in the UK and maybe to Germany, is um, the radicality that I saw in the original emerging church, which is a radical questioning of certainty, a radical questioning of wholeness, a radical embrace of the dark night of the soul. That, don't lose that. Uh, that's always, I think that's always under threat. And parotheology is an attempt to keep that alive, if that makes sense. My feeling was that your book was some, some sort of the theory for this movement, for the emerging. Yes. And when I, uh, I see a lot of uh, new churches, and um, it's to me that uh, it's just about the question that we need a new shape, a new yeah. form. But there's very... Um, yes, less theological mm. thinking. Yeah. Um, would you agree? Yeah, and my work was an attempt to create a, a, a frame to understand what emerging church could be and could become. And it was my laying a claim. It was almost like putting a flag down. <laughs> but I think I failed to some extent in the sense of I think that a lot of what was called emerging church in America um, and maybe the UK really got drawn into a more progressive frame. But I haven't given up. So, you know, I'm still fighting. I'm still fighting the cause on the outside. So my work is partly still to say, this is what emerging church could be. This is what fresh expressions could be. And I'm hoping that that minority voice stays alive. So I'm, I'm still planting my little flag and I'm still going, this is what it could be. This is what it could be. And I'm hoping that some people who watch this might go, okay, I'll explore it. I'll, I'll, you know, I've watched this interview and, oh, you know, he seems a bit crazy, but there might be something. I'll, I'll, I'll poke a little bit further. Um, and, uh, and my hope is that other people can, you know, bring this idea further than I can. Thank you. Peter Rollins. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.